Diana, thank you for joining us today. And we can't wait to hear all about the patient priority sur survey. Yay. Thanks, Ashley, for that beautiful introduction. <laughs> um, thank you for the couple of people who are our attendees uh live today and for anybody who ends up watching the recording i hope my goal for this is for it to be um informative and maybe a little bit exciting for scientists and the kdbs community um this will be a little different the style of it will be a little different from how we have like the presentations that we've had before for these types of webinars so before we've had people who are starting various clinical research projects that either focus on the KDBS community or, um, you know, are focused on a more broader developmental community. So kids who have are diagnosed with autism um, and are associated with various genetic uh, pathogenic variants. But in this case today, what we're going to spend whatever portion of the next hour on is um, some data that we've collected from you all, probably the people who might be watching this recording. Um, we collected primarily at the patient summit, but was collected in an online survey. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what was I going to say? Uh, my brain just went blank. No. Okay. So today we're going to talk about some of the data that we collected um, from the help of the foundation. And you can tell that I have another person on, Ananya Tarala, who is probably the most excellent student and has collected and analyzed a lot of the data that we're um, about to show you. So, and I hope I... Ashley or Ananya, or maybe between all three of us, if somebody asks a question, um, I'm totally happy to stop in the middle of it and answer it, or we can just go right through and go back and answer questions. Um, Ashley, if you have a preference. Okay. All right. So let me do that thing where I figure out how to share, share my screen. Um, I did it last time without any big deal here. Okay. Uh, Ananya, will you thumbs up me if you can see everything? Yes, perfect, beautiful. Okay, so uh, Ananya and I are gonna sort of tag team and switch off talking about different bits and pieces of this uh, together. So as you can see, I'm calling it, um, you know, the main focus of this study was to really understand um, the priorities or patient symptom priorities and Kuhn DeFries syndrome. So what I mean by that is um, if there were, what are the most burdensome symptoms in the individual that you care for or interact with or family member um, that if you could fix what would that what would those few symptoms be um, okay so the way that I'll go through talking about why we did it and what we did and then ultimately the exciting parts which is the results that we found um, a slide or two of background general overview of the study design and how we collected the data the uh, most interesting results that we've looked at so far, um, some overall conclusions slash like takeaways and how this study might impact our community and, and, and how we focus on moving towards clinical trials in the future. And then the person who will do this webinar next month, which will be the last Thursday of every month. Okay. So I am very aware that I'm pretty sure I present this slide every time I uh, present to the community, but I'm using it in this case. Let me move everybody's face here. It, can you see my pointer, Ananya? Will you do thumbs up? Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I'm using it in this case to show you the importance of developing or designing or just selecting the appropriate outcome measures uh, for your community. So this is an overall schematic, as you can tell, of the uh, drug development pipeline. So on the left-hand side here, where you can see my cursor, you identify the gene causing the disorder or the syndrome. 
and you develop animal models. And then as you move from left to right, you can see various bits and pieces of basic research and clinical research that are required to get towards the right-hand side of this figure, which is ultimately selecting patient-centered outcome measures. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but essentially that is the importance of selecting outcome measures to be used in clinical research or clinical trials that are both appropriate for your specific community, as well as um, important, important symptoms to be improved within the KDBS community. And that really isn't, it is impossible to figure out what patient, what priorities are in the community unless you ask the community. So that is the study that we're going to show you today. <clears throat> okay, so how do you pick outcome measures? How do you pick what you choose as an outcome measure for clinical research in a community like KDBS? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, the way you start honing in on those outcome measures is you really develop a robust natural history study where you are um, administering or collecting pieces of information that just range from a broad range of different types of assessments. And you can do this typically in the form of a natural history study. Um, we have one of those going on through uh, Dr. Kuhn and Dr. DeFries, who founded the disorder and have really been leading the way in collecting this important clinical information. Um, but in addition to uh, Drs. Kuhn and DeFries, you know, you interact with other key leaders in KDVS. So that doesn't have to be limited to specific clinicians, but you can get input and valuable insights from you know, translational scientists or even basic research scientists to give you ideas of how to pick outcome measures based upon you know, the type of intervention that you're looking to investigate. Um, the third thing, which is what uh, we've done at the foundation, is to really do patient priority studies, is to ask caregivers, educators, clinicians, family members, what matters most to you? What would make the most meaningful impact if it was improved in your daily, weekly, monthly life? Um, and then the third thing, or I guess fourth thing that I just spoke about a little bit is you need to be really careful and intentional about selecting measures that are appropriate for the patient population that you're going to study. And in this uh, and in this case, it's, you know, do you validate an existing outcome measure or do you need to develop a disease specific outcome measure for your community? So do you need to develop, for example, a specific outcome measure for um, communication or cognition and KDVS, because the ones that are existing just aren't relevant. They uh, aren't appropriate for the broad sort of clinical uh, profile of KDVS individuals. So those are two really big questions. It takes a while to, to answer, um, but that is really what's um, driving the, the results and the work that we're going to show you today. So why does this matter? Um, changes in outcome measures. So changes in the outcome measure that you select for your clinical research or your future clinical trials is ultimately, or, or I guess one of the major things that determines whether the trial is a success or a failure. If you don't see a change in the outcome measure you picked, oftentimes a trial might fail based upon those selections. So these really matter. And more importantly, we want those measures to be meaningful and helpful for caregivers in the KDS community. Okay, so the goal for the patient priority surveys um, that we completed a little bit less than a year ago um, was really to understand the most burdensome symptoms on KDVS families or as a community in general. Um, and then sort of a secondary question that we um, incorporated into the study was to really get a better understanding of the prevalence 
of symptoms that have been reported more or less anecdotally amongst the KDVS, uh, you know, patient and family and caregiver community, but hasn't really either um, been published at all or really limited information in the peer-reviewed um, uh, journals. So those are really the two primary goals um, for the patient priority uh, survey. Okay. And Anya, you're going to wave your hand if you want me to, when you want to jump in. Okay. So the study design was very simple. So with the help of the foundation and the research committee, um, part of the KDBS foundation, we designed a brief 30 question online survey to assess um, specific clinical features of KDBS and uh, specifically the symptom bur burden on caregivers, patients, and, and families. And by and large, those questions were sort of yes or no style questions. There were a handful of multiple choice questions um, and then some open-ended questions that were related to, let's say, a yes or no or a multiple choice question. So for example, if an individual, if an individual endorsed a particular question and said, yes, that symptom was present or is present in their KDS individual, um, there was an open-ended box for that person to uh, provide extra information. So then we got um, IRB approval to administer the study to, um, to our community. And then the initial sort of launch or announcement of the study we did at the KDVS 2023 summit that was in Orlando this last year. Um, we got a major response at that time um, because the summit was really well attended and we made it really easy for caregivers in the community to complete the survey at that time. Um, and then after the fact, we realized that kind of focused that limit us to, you know, the active audience at the summit and those people who were able to attend. So then we distributed it using various social media platforms and other KDVS community pages um, to really see if we could get a more diverse audience, both geographically, socioeconomically, um, racially, um, to get really the best picture of patient priorities in the biggest KDVS community that we could. All right. So um, overall results from the study are, I think, very impressive. And I'm really happy with the number of people that we got to complete the survey. So we had 99 unique caregivers complete the survey in a fairly short period of time. So we uh, first distributed the survey at the patient summit in sort of the middle of July, and then um, pulled the data for the first round of analyses uh, in the end of December. So in about six months, we got almost 100 different caregivers for KDVS individuals to respond. This is pretty impressive for a rare disease community. Um, so the individuals who completed the survey by and large were from the US and Europe, almost actually, in fact, exclusively. So. We know for a fact, based upon the foundation registry, that there are um, known KDBS individuals outside of the United States and Europe. And so this in itself is sort of a, um, an acknowledgement that we need to actively do some recruiting and um, social media work in uh, other countries to see if we can expand participation and engagement in other countries that aren't represented here. Um, so the way that we're going to show you results is not necessarily the order in which we um, administered the survey. In fact, uh, the survey first asked a handful of questions about caregiver demographics. Who are the people? What sort of the profile of the caregivers who are responding for the KDVS individual. So the survey first asks about sort of caregiver characteristics. Um, and then actually before we um, 
Before we asked questions about specific clinical characteristics of the individual with KDVS, we actually asked them to fill out the um, priority symptoms for them. So um, what are the most burdensome symptoms on their lives that they wish could be improved? And the reason that we did that first was we wanted to have the most unbiased response. So we didn't want to give anybody, um, we didn't want to remind anybody of specific symptoms before they told us, um, you know, just from their own experience, what are the symptoms that matter, matter most to them? And then we asked about, you know, some of these more unusual or underreported symptoms, as well as issues that have clinical issues that have been well documented in the literature. And is, Ananya is going to sort of walk you through, is there some things that are pretty surprising and then some things that um, are consistent with, what, with what's been published by the clinical investigators in KDVS already. Um, okay, Ananya, is this where you want to take over? You want me to keep Yeah, okay, cool. You just um, jump just over it or something. Yep, you're good. Just to introduce myself, my name is Ananya. I am a research coordinator with Combined Brain. Um, I'll be attending medical school this fall, so that's exciting. Um, and now I'm going to sort of take you through this table that's an overview of caregiver demographics. So just to kind of orient you, variables will be on the left side of the, the screen, so like ethnicity, education level, and this, this specific table is split over two slides. Um, so just to highlight a couple points, um, so if we're looking at ethnicity, you can see that 83% of the caregivers who filled out the survey were Caucasian. Um, with 17% coming from minority backgrounds, so Hispanic, Asian or Pacific Islander, mixed race, and one American Indian um, or Alaska Native individual. Um, something I think is pretty interesting is the education level of these uh, caregivers um, of an individual with KDVS. So 36% actually have a graduate degree, and 32% do have some form of college education, uh, college degree. Um, Anna, can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at relationship status, so 70, about 77% of caregivers um, are married. Um, and something we'd like to highlight is the pretty low divorce rate. Um, so something that's pretty widely known is that, you know, it is very hard to care for an individual with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So the fact that this divorce rate is pretty low is very surprising um, and something that's good to highlight. And then about 83% of caregivers own a house. And I can go to the next one. So that was the general profile of caregivers who completed the survey on behalf of their individual with KDVS. So now in this table, I'll actually review the clinical features of those individuals. So this table is a breakdown of the characteristics of KDVS participants. So again, on the left, you can see the variables. And then we separated the data by variance. So we reported data for those who have a microdeletion and individuals that have a cancel one variant. Um, what's really interesting is that this breakdown between microdeletion and cancel one variants perfectly replicates what's actually been reported consistently in the literature, which is that approximately 75% of patients have a microdeletion and 25% have a cancel one variant. So as you can see in our data, we had 77 individuals with the microdeletion and 22 with the cancel one variant. So that's really cool that that actually like accurately reports um, what's in the literature. Um, as far as an average age, we had like about an average age of 12. So for microdeletion, it was 12.5. For cancel one, it was 11.2. Thanks for doing the cursor magic, Anna. Um, and then there was an equal breakdown of males and females roughly. So about 50% um, across the variants and the total amount. Um, so looking at kind of, communication, mobility, and feeding skills. Um, I'll just pull out some major points and kind of compare across the two. So if we're looking just at communication skills, you can kind of see that the percentages for microdeletion and cancel one variants um, is pretty much the same um, across the board. We can see that uh, about 18% are nonverbal and then about on the flip side, about 50, 57, 58% can speak full sentences. Um, we're currently working to figure out how much of this is due to the age of the individual and how much is due to like a cognitive impairment because we did have a significant number of individuals in the study who were you know under the age of two. 
Um, as far as mobility, same thing here. So about 90% can walk independently, but again, the unable to crawl or walk or those who are walking with assistance, we have to look and make sure that um, it's a age thing and not or not a cognitive impairment thing. Um, and then looking at feeding skills, about 20 to 30% um, can have oral food with some restrictions, but across the board, about 70% can have oral food with no restrictions. And our next slide. Um, so along with, like Anna was speaking earlier, um, along with some input from the foundation, we assembled some major developmental domains that tend to be impacted in neurodevelopmental disorders. So these were related to like behavior, communication, emotional issues, all the things that are kind of on the left side of the screen. Um, and this is also going to carry over into the next slide because there were a lot of domains. Um, so looking a bit across microdeletion and cancel one variants, again, they were there was not too much of a difference um, as far as the symptoms that were reported between the two. Um, but again, I'll highlight some where there was like a 10% difference. So behavior, about 32% of microdeletion individuals had behavior issues where it was just about 23% for CANZEL-1. Um, looking at developmental delay in cognition, it was 80% for microdeletion, 91% for CANZEL-1, and then emotional issues, 27% um, of, of caregivers with a microdeletion patient um, reported emotional issues, whereas it was only 14% for CANZEL-1. Um, so yeah, as you can see, for the most part, it was pretty similar, but there are a few uh, domains that there was a slight difference. And if you go to the next slide, um, it was pretty much the same here as well, um, looking at musculoskeletal pain, respiratory seizures, and visual issues. Um, musculoskeletal issues, there was almost a 10% difference. Uh, cancel one variants tend to have it a bit more. And then respiratory issues, about 56% of patients with a microdeletion had respiratory issues and 41% for cancel one. And we're going to go in depth into some of these categories in the next couple slides um, and break down those individual symptoms further. So looking at seizures, um, about half of the caregivers reported that their child had or is currently having some form of epilepsy. Um, so the most common types of seizures that about like 10% of KDVS, KDVS individuals had like each were absence, febrile, focal epilepsy, tonic-clonic seizures, status epilepticus, I always say that wrong, and tonic seizures. Um, so those are kind of the major ones, but as you can see, there's a few other um, categories in there as well that KDVS individuals had. Um, next slide. And then looking a bit at cardiac abnormalities, so 24% of caregivers reported cardiac defects in their child with KDVS. Um, as you can see, the big major category that was most common was atrial septal defect. About 25% of individuals with a cardiac defect had an ASD. And then the other big category was the ventricle, ventricular septal defect, so about 9% um, had a VSD. But again, you can see that there's a lot of other symptoms that were reported, but those are just the two major ones. And with that, Anna, I'm gonna hand it right back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so um, the two, so seizures, as Ananya was just talking about, uh, seizure prevalence, that is one of the symptoms that's been probably most, one of the most well-reported in KDVS. So, um, the fact that we also show that approximately 50% of individuals with KDVS have seizures, this is um, perfectly in line with what previous people have published. There's a lot fewer, there's much fewer um, pieces of information about cardiac uh, deficits that Ananya just went over, as well as um, these next few symptoms that we focus on, which one of the ones that is most surprising is a uh, genital urinary or urogenital deficits in KDVS. So um, as you can see, there's an incredibly high rate at which these types of issues are reported in the population. So almost exactly 50% of caregivers reported that their child, which keep in mind is a mix between males and females, pretty even mix between males and females, um, had some type of urogenital problem. Um, so the layout of this figure is a little bit different from how Ananya 
the, the tables that we showed in the previous slides and that the 50% that didn't endorse any issues are shown right here in this gray, approximately half of the pie. But you can see of those that did endorse some type of urogenital problem, um, about a quarter of those are related to issues with undescended testicles, um, kidney reflux, or just missing one or both kidneys altogether it has approximately 9%. There's also other kidney issues. So kidney reflux is reported in 9% of the population as well. Um, So the other thing that um, a couple investigators, in particular um, Dr. Kulin, are getting interested in, um, also because of sort of just anecdotal information that's been reported um, by families and observed by various clinicians, is this interest in um, the possibility that individuals with KDVS might have some sort of weakened or compromised immune system. Um, and you can see there's certainly a quite wide variety of different issues that are either really directly or somehow indirectly related to immune function or system here. But overall, about 38% of people who uh, completed the survey reported some issue either having or currently has some deficit or problem related to the immune system. Um, and by and large, those are primarily related to um, frequent infections or a weakened immune system, also frequent respiratory infections and asthma. So these represent about somewhere between 15% of these individuals um, and then approximately 12% of KDVS individuals who endorse immune issues with immune system, their immune system. Um, have about 12% of those uh, are because of asthma or either frequent respiratory infections. Um, chronic hives or various rashes have been reported, um, as well as eczema has also been reported in about 8% of uh, caregivers completing the survey. Um, the other thing that sort of falls under this category is um, issues with breathing problem or breathing problems or issues with respiration, general issues with respiration. And this one is actually pretty surprising. So we have about 58% of caregivers reported that in their individual with KDVS, it had some type of either had or currently has a respiratory problem. Um, almost 7% have been either diagnosed or told or a tracheomalacia that has been reported. 13% um, have some form of sleep apnea, um, laryngeomalacia, and 16% of individuals. Um, and then no surprise, there's um, sort of general breathing problems relating to the high prevalence of hypotonia in individuals with KDVS. And then as on the last side, um, there's a pretty, almost a 20% rate of asthma being diagnosed in, in individuals with KDVS. So um, once we started looking, really diving into this uh, data, the foundation really thought that, you know, a, a question related to this would be, um, and these really high rates of breathing problems, general breathing issues, um, that they were also interested in knowing, okay, well, maybe these breathing problems have an impact on how kids go under anesthesia. If, if kids have issues, either using anesthesia or recovering from, from anesthesia for various clinical procedures. Um, so we asked, <clears throat> We asked this question um, and the way it was phrased was, did your kid, has your kid undergone anesthesia, general anesthesia or um, anesthesia of any form for some type of clinical procedure? Um, and you can see that 82 individuals um, had in some form or another, 62 had micro, or were, were children or young adults with microdeletions and 20 were individuals that had a Cancel 1 variant. Um, and so this is overall number here. This is not percentage here on the y-axis. 
Um, and so you can see that, you know, there is a good percentage of individuals that didn't report any type of complication uh, while they were under anesthesia. However, there is um, between microdeletion and CANSA-1, there's about 20 individuals that did report some type of issue with anesthesia or recovery process. So the way this question was structured was yes or no. And then if you wanted to provide any additional details um, on the type of issue that the person experienced, um, they could provide that information as sort of an open text box. And here are just some of the most I think uh, telling or dramatic responses that caregivers gave us, which is that um, they had airway issues for days requiring you know, uh, steroid treatment. Um, they had a lot of breathing issues with trouble being extubated and takes almost an entire day to wake up from anesthesia usually. Um, or most of these procedures that might typically be outpatient have to be inpatient for this uh, uh, individual. Someone reported that they were in a coma for five days afterwards, um, and then issues with oxygenation or vomiting immediately or sort of chronically post uh, anesthesia. So this is something that I, I don't think has really been dived into much in the literature yet and KDBS and the fact that about 20% of individuals report issues with anesthesia, I think has um, some really interesting clinical implications in how, you know, the different types of anesthesia or different types of monitoring that um, might be warranted for when individuals with KDBS uh, go under anesthesia. Okay, so finally, we get to one of the um, main, main goals of the study, which is really to dig in and to figure out of all of the symptoms that your uh, caregivers have reported, what are the ones that are in most burdensome uh, in your lives or your family's lives? And so the way that the survey question was phrased, I put it right here on this slide, which is, if you had a pill that would treat the three most disruptive symptoms, what would those be? Um, and so um, what we did was you can see each sort of symptom domain. So the symptom that caregivers reported was categorized into the different symptom domains that Ananya presented on our uh, you know, clinical demographics. So a broad range of symptom domains that could have been selected. So issues with GI, motor, um, you know, some of the ones that actually aren't on this uh, graph right here because nobody endorsed them as a top priority. Um, so you can see the different symptom domains are reported in different colors here. So, so co cognition in blue, communication in red, uh, symptoms, the various neurological symptoms in this yellow, behavioral in green, and then emotional in orange. Um, the way the figure is laid out is it's sort of bucketed by the age of the individual with KDBS for which the caregiver had reported on behalf of. You can see an incredibly clear and very consistent um, uh, priority for um, improving communication in, in kids between the ages of zero and five, as well as individuals who have children with KDS between the ages of six and 12. So between zero and 12, caregivers' top priority is really um, improving communication in, in individuals with KDS. And then very close second is uh, improving cognition, so overall cognition um, and cognitive ability in those individuals, and then neurological symptoms. Now, when you shift sort of to the upper half of the individuals that were uh, sort of reported or um, represented in this survey, so individuals between 13 and 21, and then older than 21, uh, you can see that cognition still, by and large, is one of the top priority symptoms that if they could improve with a pill, 
um, that would be their top priority. However, issues with communication aren't reported uh, anymore. In fact, they're uh, more concerned with issues with behavioral um, problems and then emotional disturbances as they're over go over the age of 21. Um, and so we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next couple of slides, but just to give you an appreciation for, you know, this sort of goes back to one of the first slides that we talked about, which is um, really carefully picking outcome measures that matter to the community. And so looking at this figure based upon caregiver responses, we are really going to need to think carefully about um, picking good outcome measures for communication and cognition across all age groups, as well as um, measures and indicators of behavioral changes, as well as emotional changes as well in um, older cohorts with KDBS. Anna, we have a question in the chat. Let me stop. Okay, hold on here. Just to, an just to answer gonna... the question, on the survey of the three most disruptive symptoms, did the survey give symptom options to choose from or did the caregiver have to list three of their own? Yep, great question. Um, so it was totally open-ended. Um, so I tried to explain this in the first couple of slides, but so the way this the, the survey was, was the first was like, tell us some questions about yourself. So the caregiver completed some sort of questions and answers about their own demographics. And then one of the next questions was, um, one of these is like, how does KDBS impact your life the most? And then this question, if you had a pill that would treat the three most disruptive symptoms, what would they be? Nothing else. And then an open text box. So then what we did was um, Ananya, we sort of bucketed people's open-ended responses based upon what they said. So for example, if they said seizures, we count that as like a neurological problem, an issue related to the neurological domain. If they said, um, I wish my kid could um, communicate better with um, their family and their friends, then um, that goes under the box of um, communication problems. So yeah. They weren't given any sort of check boxes. It was purely, purely open-ended. So, and the reason that we did that was because we didn't want to sort of bias their responses towards the type of domains that we thought were important. So this is like completely unbiased. Good question. Okay. Any other questions? I don't, um, I don't see any other ones. Okay. So I think these are the main takeaways, although we did just sort of go through a, a, a lot of new data, a lot of uh, previously reported data that's just consistent with other papers. Um, but I think uh, some of the main things were one, there's no clear differences in symptoms between individuals harboring, you know, cancel one variants versus individuals who have the micro deletion. That's been reported many times in the literature. Ananya just showed it in her first couple of tables. In fact, that's primarily the reason why when we showed you those uh, uh, pie charts with the different types of symptoms reported, the cardiac deficits, breathing, immune, urogenital problems, there was only one chart because there weren't any significant differences between those reported in microdeletion uh, patients versus cancel one patients. Um, so yes, we confirmed estimates of symptom prevalence for a handful of different symptoms. That being, it's been estimated uh, that about 50% of KDBS individuals have epilepsy in some type in some period of their life, and we replicated the same thing. Um, we go into a little more detail about the different types of epilepsy profiles that individuals have, um, but those don't differ between microdeletion patients and individuals with KDBS. We have shown that about 25% of individuals with KDBS have cardiac deficits, and by and large, most of these are congenital deficits, so something that is anatomically uh, wrong or abnormal um, in individuals with KDBS. 
And then we did sort of more fine tune assessments on specific respiratory immune um, problems and then hypogonadism and urogenital issues. So about 50% of individuals reported respiratory problems. Um, and among those, we saw that nearly a quarter had issues recovering from anesthesia. About 50% had urogenital issues um, in, in the population that were reported. Um, and then the, you know, the main goal of the study, which we finally got to towards the very end was, you know, getting an unbiased view of what our caregivers priorities for improving symptoms. Um, and those are uh, overlapping for people who have KDVS individuals between zero and 12. So they hope to improve um, cognitive, cognitive communication ability um, and sort of management of neurological, various neurological symptoms. Um, and then uh, the sort of upper age bracket, so individuals who are 13 or older, um, their main priorities were the same in that they cared about cognitive and neurological symptom improvement. But in those older ages, um, they were really starting to be concerned about managing behavioral and emotional uh, problems in, in those older cohort, cohorts. Um, okay, so none of this work uh, you know, it relies really heavily on the leaders, basic research and clinical researchers in the field. Um, so a lot of the work, like I said, has either been published before by some of the leaders that are shown here um, in, in KDVS. And um, so we rely heavily on their shoulders and really just confirm some of the, uh, the work that we, they've done previously. And then some more of the recent research is really driven by these people, the research committee at the foundation that are talking about what's been reported in sort of social media pages amongst their community and haven't really been investigated in any sort of in-depth formal way. Um, and some of these symptoms as we found um, could really have some implications for clinical management of KDVS. Um, okay, so with that, uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, before I forget, I just remembered two things. So one are, uh, actually, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to go back. So I'm going to put, before I forget, because I know I'll forget, the link to this online survey um, is hyperlinked in these slides, but we will put it in the recording so people can actually see um, the version of the online sur survey that people have completed, but you're also welcome if you haven't completed it already. It does take between 15 and 20 minutes. We really encourage people outside the U.S. and Europe um, to, to, to complete this survey. Um, and then the last thing, which I wanted to say, and then I'm... okay, so um, with that, the next webinar that we're going to have um, will be next, it'll be Thursday, April 25th, we're going to move it to 11 a.m. Central Time, um, hopefully, because we are going to have someone from the Wilsey Lab, um, James Schmidt, who is a wonderful graduate student in Helen Wilsey's lab. Um, they are at UC uh, San Francisco, which is why we're not going to make them wake up at 7 a.m. to present to us. But they're doing some really cool translational work in looking at the role of Cancel 1 and cilia, formation and function. But they're using both animal models and humans. Um, so they're really doing translational work. Um, and I think you guys will all be really excited about the work that they're doing. And so they're going to present at our uh, next webinar. Um, okay. And then, yeah. So I am happy. I see there's a couple of questions in the chat. So I am going to stop sharing my slides. And so I can see people's faces and if I can clearly see what they hear about. And then I'm going to start asking questions. Um, okay.
So question is, if people can't remember if they filled it out, should they fill it out again? Uh, yes, you can totally do that because part of the survey um, asks you to put your email address. Um, so we don't use that to contact you. We basically just use that to see if you filled it out before. So we get that the survey burden amongst rare disease communities is a little insane. And so we don't assume that you will remember when you've completed one survey, survey over another, over another. So as long as you put your email address and you're willing to fill out the 15, 20 minute survey again, you're welcome to complete it again because we will have your email address kept from the last time that you completed it. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, no, we have a few more. Um, oh, okay. uh, Lana was asking if the data has been published yet or if not, it oh, will. Oh, it is not. Oh, it is not, but that is the goal. So if you saw at the bottom of our slides, um, we have a draft of the manuscript um, and are hoping to send that out and get it submitted very soon. But the goal is to publish everything um, that you saw on these slides today. We did have a lot, so I think that it might end up being two, um, two publications. And our last um, question right now is from Blake. Can you give an example of how the KDBS Foundation has used an outcome measure from the survey to adjust course on existing projects or to consider for future research priorities? Uh, oh, what a wonderful question. Um, so I, I think the main takeaway in terms of like really using the patient priority response that really highlighted um, you know, those two primary domains, cognition and communication, at least amongst the younger cohort. Um, it really highlights the fact that when we are establishing um, natural history studies or future clinical research studies that include KDVS, um, that we need to carefully pick um, measures of communication and cognition um, that will be appropriate for the broadest range of KDBS individuals that are eligible for that clinical research uh, study. So what I mean by that is, you know, we've been reaching out and we'll continue to reach out to the, you know, the lead clinicians and researchers who are studying communication, and we have a few of them that are doing um, incredible work uh, in KDBS and evaluating uh, different deficits or issues with communication and speech abilities um, to, to get their insights into, you know, what types of assessments exist for measuring communication um, and are they appropriate to use for clinical trials with a specific age range or do we need to think about developing um, new ones? So hopefully I answered your question instead of just um, talking and staring at myself on Zoom. <laughs> Ashley, you have any questions? Nope, I'm all good. I, this looks awesome. I'm super excited. I can't wait to, to share even more of this data, I think, with our families and get it published and then just keep growing interest in KDBS. Woo. Okay, well, my email address was on the last slide. And if you want Ananya's email address, I can give it to you. Um, well, yeah, thank you everyone for joining and make sure to tune in, tune in uh, uh, next month <laughs> for the presentation by the Wolsey Lab. Thank you, Anna and Ananya. We appreciate all your work on this and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.